Okay, today's video is about annoying puzzles, and I want to start with what I think is possibly the most annoying puzzle in the world. So uh, it's a simple enough question. Just imagine the Department for Transport is looking at a road layout, and they've got two different possibilities for the road layout, and they're trying to figure out which one is going to cause the fewest accidents. So let me just set out the possibilities. Okay, this is road layout A, this is road layout B, okay? Very easy. Now, both of them are predicted to have a certain number of major accidents. Major accidents, this is gonna put people in hospital, we're talking broken bones, you know, serious stuff. There's also a certain number of minor accidents. That might just be like a bit of first aid, you might need to see a doctor, cuts and scrapes, that sort of thing. Okay, it's really simple. Each of these different road layouts is gonna cause a certain number of major and minor uh, road accidents, and I just want you to fill in this gap here. So here we go, 2,000, 1,000, 16. Now what goes here to make these two schemes equivalent? It feels like eight. Doesn't it feel like eight? Doesn't it feel like eight? So this puzzle, comes from Shane Frederick, who's a behavioral economist, psychologist at Yale University. Yale University, they're smart at Yale University. And he asked a whole bunch of Yale University students what the answer was, and the most common number, it was a, a bit more than a quarter of them, said eight. The next most common answer was 32. And the next most common answer was, if I remember rightly, 1016. Let's have a think about what's going on here. Road layout A is gonna cause 2,000 major accidents. This is people in hospital. Oh, and 16 people with bumps and bruises. Okay. So why do we even care about this? Road layout B is gonna cause only 1,000 major accidents. So that's much better. So how many minor accidents would make it equivalent to, to road layout A? And the reason this is an annoying question is because I mean, there's no, there is no right answer, but it's got to be like a lot. It's got to be many thousands, surely many thousands, because these are trivial accidents and these are substantial. And a very small number of people in Shade Frederick's uh, survey did say 10,000, 100,000, a million. And there's no right answer, but you know, it's got to be something like that. But so many, just like you, Brady, the majority of people, or the, the largest minority of people, uh, more than a quarter of people said, oh, we think that the correct answer is eight. And when you look at this, you, your mind is wanting you to say eight, right? Because it's like, it just puts everything in the same proportion, right? Same, you've been asked, make these the same, that's the same. This is a, a, an example, it's quite a, quite a fascinating example, quite a complicated example of something that Shane Frederick studies, which he calls cognitive reflection problems. And they were made famous by the psychologist Daniel Kahneman in his book Thinking Fast and Slow, but this one is not in Thinking Fast and Slow. So this one is, this has barely seen the light of day and I find it fascinating. But um, uh, another example, this one's made very famous by Thinking Fast and Slow is a bat and a ball together cost a dollar ten. And the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So how much does the bat cost? You may well have heard this before, a lot of people have, uh, and instinctively you just think, well, it's a dollar, right? Because uh, the bat costs a dollar more than the, the, the ball. Uh, how much does it, they cost a dollar ten together, so it's like a dollar and ten. But that's not right, because that's 90 cents. And in fact, the correct answer is the ball costs five cents, the bat costs a dollar and five cents. But people leap to the wrong answer. Um, you want more? Oh yeah, this is a classic, easier in the time of coronavirus. Imagine a lake that is filling with lily pads, there's this patch of uh, lily pads on the lake and the patch doubles in size every day. And after 48 days, the lake is completely covered. So the question is, on what day, out of the 48 days, on what day is the lake half covered? Uh, and people often go, oh well, 48 divided by two, um, it's 24, or they'll, they'll sort of plot some kind of curve in their mind and they'll say, oh, maybe it's like 32 or something. But of course the actual answer is 47 days because the patch is doubling in size every day. So it's half full the day before you get to 48. That's what exponential growth uh, looks like and we've kind of found that the hard way. You know, why do people get these things wrong? Why do people mess these cognitive reflection tests up? Why don't people look at this and go, 
There is no right answer, but it's got to be something like 10,000 or 100,000 or a million. The reason it's annoying is we don't even have the information we need to give the correct answer. But what we do know is it can't possibly be eight. Why can't it be eight? Because to look at that, if yep. you look at major accidents, it looks like road A is twice as dangerous as road, as road B. B. Yeah, so we, remember what we're being asked. We're being asked to make these two equivalent. We're being asked to, to, uh, to say, well, how many minor accidents would it be for, for road layout B to be the equivalent of road layout A? So well, the answer is, well, it's the same as how many minor accidents are the equivalent of 16 minor accidents plus a thousand extra major accidents. Right. And the answer says, well, we don't know, but it's got to be, a, it's got to be at least a thousand and sixteen. It's a bit apples yeah, and oranges though, isn't it? Because like, what's a, what's a major accident worth? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's, there's, there's no answer to the question, which is why I say it's the most annoying question in the world. But you don't look at it and go, oh, there's not enough, there's not enough information. We need, we need an exchange rate of major to minor accidents. What you do is you look at it and you go, eight. I mean, you might not, but an awful lot of very smart students at Yale University immediately said eight. A whole other bunch, not quite as many, said 32. And another bunch, not quite as many, said 1,016. Uh, 1,016 is maybe just about right if you say, well, we're just going to count accidents and we can't compare them. But really, the answer's got to be you know, a lot. Way, way more than 1,016. Do you know what the problem with that question is? You straight away forget what you're trying to solve. Yeah, you, well, you, don't, yeah. you, you forget the question. But that's, it. that's interesting though, isn't it? Because it's, you know, I told you, I told you the story. We're trying to compare these layouts. We're trying to figure out, you know, which, which layout, we're trying to, what, what's the equivalent of the two layouts? And you, Daniel Kahneman often says, when we're given a difficult question, we often substitute an easy question and we don't notice that that's what we've, that's, e that's exactly what I did. Because I thought there was a solution, I contrived a question in my head that had a solution. Yes, absolutely. And eight looks about right. I mean, you, you're absolutely right, Grady. Eight is the... Of course it's eight. Of course it's eight. But of course it's not eight. It's not even close to eight. So why do I find these cognitive reflection um, problems interesting? It's because my own interest is in how we think about statistical claims in the news. You know, when people see a claim on social media, they see it on Twitter, on Facebook, they see a newspaper headline, they see a talking head on TV. How do we think about uh, those claims? How do we process them? And uh, it's tempting as a nerd to go straight to you know, the technical details. Have they confused correlation and causation? You know, have they, um, is it within the margin of error? All the sort of statistical questions you might ask. Um, but actually, very often, what's getting between us and the truth is our own tendency to leap to conclusions. Just as you saw this and you thought, eight, that sounds about right. Very often we see somebody talking and we very quickly go, yeah, that can't be right. That's just fake news. What would you expect you know, from those guys? Or instead they go, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds right. This goes to prove I was, I was right all along. I always knew that this government was, you know, was full of rogues and villains and, and they can't be trusted with anything. I, you know, I was having this argument with my friends in the pub last night, ha, in the pub. I remember the pub. Um, I was having this argument with my friends last night and this proves I was right. And we leap in with this emotional reaction. There was a really interesting study published, I think about a year ago by uh, Gordon Pennycook and a bunch of other psychologists. And Gordon Pennycook is interested in fake news and why fake news spreads and why, why people spread misinformation. What they found was you could take a, a bunch of people who were say diehard Trump supporters and show them a ridiculous claim like 500 migrant caravanners have been intercepted at the Mexican border wearing suicide vests. You know, if you show them that claim in the wild, they might well click on it. They might well amp amplify it, like it, share it. And you ask them and they'll say, yeah, yeah, that, that is the kind of thing I might share. If you instead go, just wait a moment. How likely do you think that claim is to be true? There's no judgment. Do you think that claim is likely to be true? About 90% of them will go, Actually, yeah, that can't, like, why would they be wearing suicide vests? Why would, why would migrant, it doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense. And so they're, they're able to see, despite the fact they have a strong you know, view of the world, we all have strong views of the world, they're able to see that that can't be true. And yet at the same time, in a moment of distraction, a moment of inattention, they would, they admit that they would retweet it, they would amplify it. And I think 
I personally wouldn't be amplifying stuff about migrant caravanners in suicide vests, but we all have stuff that we see that we, we are tempted to retweet because it fits our biases. I, mean, I can give you an example. Um, a few years ago, I saw a graph about support for same-sex marriage. Personally, um, I think that's great news. More Americans in favor of uh, equal rights for everybody, great. And I retweeted this graph, which I think was from a, the Washington Post or a perfectly decent source. And I tweeted it because of my emotional reaction. Like, oh, that looks right, great, tweet. 150,000 followers. The very first reply was, Tim, have you looked at the axes on that graph? And I hadn't, and actually it was a mess. It was, they'd done that thing where the, the opinion polls, the questions had been asked um, different distances apart. So maybe 10 years would pass and then they'd ask it twice within one year and they were all equally spread. The whole thing was a mess. I should have clipped it for my bad data visualization file, but instead I was amplifying it to all of my followers on Twitter because it just seemed like the kind of thing that should be true when I wanted it to be true when I wanted to, to share the news. Just like this seems like it should be eight. I love these puzzles because I, you know, I love being tricked and falling over my, you know, my own feet mentally. I love watching other people get tricked by funny little puzzles, but there's something deeper going on here. When we're reading the newspapers, looking at social media, we shouldn't be just accepting or rejecting things because they feel right, because they fit our view of the world. You only need to notice your own emotions, count to three, have a little think, and that is a way to stop yourself spreading misinformation. If you enjoyed this, why not check out Tim Harford's book, How to Make the World Add Up. It's also out in America under a different title, The Data Detective, or The Data Detective, if that's how you like to say it. There are links in the description. And if you like puzzles, why not check out today's episode sponsor, Brilliant. They've got a site bursting with puzzles, quizzes, interactive courses like the ones you can see on screen now all superbly designed to guide you through the wonderful worlds of mathematics, computers, science, all sorts of other stuff. This scientific thinking course already has my mind buzzing. Or why not up your game with some statistics? It's like a fully equipped gym for your brain. You can get 20% off a premium subscription by going to brilliant.org and adding that slash number file. Again, brilliant.org slash number file. had some delicious toast, one bit with peanut butter and a different bit with cheese. Because, mm. you know, living the dream.